Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First United Methodist Church, South Charleston. We are live this morning due to the impending weather, and uh, wherever you are, we're thrilled you're joining us on this, what's going to be very snowy, Sunday morning. Our call to worship today is a prayer reflection. Was Puccini's music for his ears alone, or was Starry Night only for Van Gogh's eyes? Are discerners of spirits better than those who prophesy? Is it better to be a healer than a preacher? Was Mother Teresa more important than the Jesuit brother who held the door? Is red better than blue? All gifts are from the same spirit. They are each a part of the whole and given to each of us for each other or for the common good. Lord, help us understand. Thank you for all gifts. This is Mike Cedor. Not too long ago, Pastor Paul and I uh, talked about the um, spiritual gifts that uh, I found on the website uh, for the West Virginia Conference. And I know Pastor Paul has talked about that in a sermon or two over the last several months. And so I wanted to take a few moments just to show you where that uh, spiritual gifts uh, information re or toolkit is on the uh, West Virginia Conference website and how easy it is to uh, fill out the information and complete your own spiritual gifts inventory. So if you go to wvumc.org, you'll see right on the homepage, there's an article or a little click here for spiritual gifts, resources uh, for uh, clergy and laity. So if you click on this link, it'll take you to a page where it has some information about the spiritual gifts. Um, and there's a link right here is to go to take the, the, um, the inventory for yourself. Um, you can also look at the frequently asked questions and there's some more information down below. Um, the uh, information is free, doesn't cost anything, and it prepares uh, a nice little um, summary of what each of the spiritual gifts are that you have based on how you answer the, the questions. So if you have more information, um, you can use that to, to kind of help you work within the church in the different levels. So here are um, some different ways that um, you might be able to get involved. So if you would take a few moments, you can click on the link and um, go to, to take your spiritual gifts inventory. If you have any questions, please feel free to talk to Pastor Paul. There is uh, a lot of great information in here and I'll go ahead and click on the link so you can see the kinds of questions that are asked in there. So uh, during this inventory, it'll ask you to range uh, the, the question or the answers uh, for all these questions um, from a one to seven. So um, the questions are fairly easy and we want you to go with your gut reaction to each of those questions. So this is just the sample page uh, or you know, it actually is the survey. Um, and if you need more instructions or information, there is 80 questions uh, to answer and that helps narrow down your, your uh, gifts based on a number of different criteria. Um, so real quickly, I'll just pull up um, on my screen just to show you. So this is the, the one that I completed and it gives me the, the top, uh, I don't even have how many, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six um, results for, for my spiritual gifts. And then over here is also the, um, the definitions that I, I generated the PDF to to um, give me all the definitions of all the spiritual gifts. Um, so if you have any questions, again, please feel free to talk to Pastor Paul. Um, he can help you go with guidance through this. Um, and it does generate a nice little, little PDF. You can do with that what you will, whether you want to share it with the church or keep it to yourself. That's up to you. But again, my name is Mike Seedor, and I'm with the tech team here at First Church. And if you have any questions um, or would like to get involved with 
our tech team, please feel free to give me a, a shout or you know grab me after church. Um, we'd love to, to have, bring you on board. So thank you, and we hope this was helpful. Have a great day. Well, good morning, church. I am praying that all of you are safe and sound, warm and at home, in comfy clothes, getting ready for the impending storm. We, we had a number of things planned this morning, and it looked like we were going to be right in the middle of the storm by the time it ended. So that's why the decision was made to go live this morning online. In fact, to let you know that things sometimes glow, go awry around here, we actually recorded the service about 45 minutes ago and then found out that it didn't record. So this actually is a live presentation to you this morning. You just saw a nice promo that was put together by Mike Cedar for the spiritual gifts inventory. Uh, if you have not done that yet, I urge you to go ahead and do it. If you do not have the resources at home in the way of a computer or a laptop, uh, stop by the office here at the church. We'll be more than happy to set you up and allow you to do that. The one thing that I want to remind you is that once you take the test, if you don't print it off or save it to a PDF, it disappears in the system. So there's nobody that can pull it up other than you when you take the test. But we really would like to take a look at that. And as Mike said, when you get the results back, there are about 20 different spiritual gifts that are measured on this test. You will receive a report that shows your top six and then the details on your top three, an explanation. Uh, and I took the test this week just to see exactly where I fall out now, because as your career changes and as you change, so do these personality profiles, whether it's a Briggs Stratton or this spiritual gifts inventory, they don't always measure exactly the same. But uh, to let you know that I have my report right here, and my top three results were teaching, administration, and faith. So I think you have me in the right job uh, for what my spiritual gifts are. But again, we, we would like you to do these. If you would like to discuss them with me, that would be great because over the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking about gifts and what we can do in the church and how that no matter what your life situation or your age or, or where you are in your particular goals and lifespan, there's something for you here at the church uh, in doing our community outreach and in growing our congregation uh, of faith and being together in the unity that Paul talks about. This morning's scripture lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the workings of miracles. And to another, prophesy. To another, the discernment of spirits. And to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I'd like to share with you our prayer request for this week. 
the family of Michelle Oldeker, Peggy King's niece who passed away, Dr. Al Deerdorf, who's in the hospital, Danny Murphy, who is home from the hospital, Terry Moore, Alicia Hall, Karen Johnston, David Moore, Nancy Wolf, Fred Wells, David Bumgarner, Becky and Cindy, my coworkers, Bob and Jean Warner, Natalie Price, Barney Lilly, Charlene Sims, Pat and Ralph Burchett, Sarah Pemberton Ratliff, Rod Allen Quinn, Teresa Myers, Erica Windham, Jack and Helen Chapman, Sam Femia, Bill Jeanette, and Connie Rollins. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. This is how Paul starts chapter 12 of his epistle to the Corinthians. These are the texts that we will be using for the next few weeks, brought to us by the Committee on United Methodist Discipleship. Reverend Dr. Derek Weber, who heads up that organization, has given us a very nice series to work with, and we are using a lot of the material that comes from that. Even if you don't know all of the letters and what's in them, you know that Paul wrote an awful lot of the New Testament. In fact, many times I have the belief that perhaps more churches have a Pauline philosophy than they do a Christian philosophy. But they go hand in hand in everything that they do. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be covering some of these passages that are going to be very familiar to you. And there are going to be some of the more beloved chapters of the epistle. But I think you will recognize a lot of what we're talking about, whether you're really studying Paul or not. But it would be helpful if maybe over the next week or so that you do read up on some of these letters in the epistles, especially those to the Corinthians. Now, Corneth. Well, it was called the sin city of its day, sort of like Sodom and Gomorrah, Las Vegas, Atlantic City. These are the names that come to mind when you hear that word, Sin City. There was so much activity and so much going on there that it's really hard to describe it in any particular terms other than to say anything that could go on probably was going on. So if that was the case, it was probably pretty hard to become a follower of Jesus in a city like that. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Business was only interested in business and making a profit. They really didn't care who they stepped on to do it. There wasn't a connection between all the people. There were the very rich, there were the very poor. Wasn't a whole lot in between. So Paul starts out talking about this and <clears throat> he mentions things like gifts, services, activities. And we want to know whether these are all the same things or just the same notions with different names. Are they just different ways of talking about that common experience that we might have? One of the problems that the church at Corneth was having was there was a feeling of superiority among a few super Christians. Now, I'd like to say that that idea has been totally wiped out in the centuries since Paul wrote this, but it still happens. Paul, in this letter, was trying to level the playing field in response to those that were, well, holding themselves above others because of the kinds of gifts that they display. Now, no doubt, like now, there are those who think they don't have any particular gift of the Spirit. But the truth is, all are empowered by the Spirit. All of us have gifts in one way or another that contribute to the use of the body. 
So what is it that's going on here at the beginning of the text? It's a little puzzling. And there are a variety of interpretations, as there is with just about any section of the Bible. But we do believe that the main thrust of this text is one of unity. What Paul is doing here is trying to remind those super Christians that they started somewhere too and that they did not become representatives of the faith that they believed that they are all on their own power. Even the very beginning of their faith journey or what we would call a discipleship path was supported, empowered, even made possible by the Holy Spirit. It isn't them. It isn't something special about their own abilities or strengths or even their knowledge. Even the extremely basic understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord comes at the prompting of the Spirit. Now, a few years back, President Obama told us in one of his speeches that uh, we didn't get where we were all on our own. Now, that raised a few feathers here and there. Because a lot of people believe it was by their own good work, their own ability, pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps, that they built the business that they have. But President Obama reminded us that there were other things in play. There were infrastructures, there was financing, there was different things that came about and no one person got everywhere thing that they wanted all on their own, that there was a connection, be it community, governmental, or whatever, that we somehow worked together. Now, we many times think we get where we are all on our own. We think we've wrestled with this faith thing and put in place our own goodness, our efforts and abilities, and they've got us as far as we are on this path. And certainly, we are called to work out our own salvation. Paul says that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. Now, some wonder if this is maybe a counterforce or a guerrilla group or whatever you want to call it, some gang or cartel that was out there in the Corinthian community and that they were actively working against this new Christian movement. This probably was their catchphrase, let Jesus be cursed. But the Spirit... The Spirit is all about building up the body. The Spirit is about letting Christ and Christ's example lead at all times. If you, by contrast, are the cause of division, you are cursing Christ and therefore not speaking by the Spirit. Paul is sending out a cautionary word here and a cautionary word that we pastors still today need to set forth every once in a while. If you're causing a ruckus, if you're causing a division in your church, you are not going about the work of Jesus Christ. You're not finding a way to be part of the body in unity. There is a necessity for the church to gather together in such a way that we are unified in our purpose of presenting Christ to the world around us and the communities that we live in. But what about these gifts that Paul's talking about? Would it be helpful to run through Paul's list and identify in our minds and hearts what kinds of things that we could be gifted with? There again, I refer back to the spiritual gifts inventory list. These varieties of gifts, since that really is the title of my sermon, even though you may not see that right here, that might be useful. But let's talk about the key three, wisdom, knowledge, and faith. These are the very first tier of gifts in a community existence. Now, 
once you get into that, and that may not be your personal gifts top of the list thing, but it's going to be there on all of us at one point or another. We would also start to notice those gifts that are a little more flamboyant or flashy. We would want to see those gifts of healings and miracles, prophecy and discernment of spirits. Now, these are great things. And some people do have those gifts. And maybe not in the essence that we really think of them. For instance, if we look at healing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are the one that's capable of laying a hand on someone and healing whatever's going on and then walking away. Healing takes place in a variety of ways. It can be as simple as listening to someone as they tell their story, as they work through their own emotional balances as they need to talk with folks. It could be as simple as giving forgiveness for something that has happened in the past or bringing two people together who haven't spoke for a number of years. There are a lot of ways that healing goes on, not only in the church, but in the communities around us. Now, I want you to notice that Paul puts speaking in tongues at the very bottom of the list. That's because at this particular time, that was a gift that was thought to be very, very important. But it was being used as a wedge to divide the community. It was dividing the church. If you were able to speak in tongues, then that was wonderful. You were given this gift. If you weren't able to speak in tongues, then, well, there's still something wrong in your life, and you've got some sin to work out. Now... One thing about speaking in tongues is that somebody has to be able to interpret what you're saying. And many times those things don't come hand in hand. So if you speak in a tongue but no one's able to discern it, what gift is it? And sometimes it's the flashy stuff that we notice more than anything else. Now, that makes me think that perhaps listing every gift in the description here is well it's not supposed to be so exhaustive that I in a sermon that I bore you with it in fact the list that goes on isn't even Paul's best list in contrast Paul's real goal is to say that our diversity is our unity in our individual giftedness is our communal strength now, our diversity is very important to us as a church. I don't want to be preaching to a whole congregation of people that look and act and speak exactly like me. The glare and the reflection on Sunday morning might be more than I could take. We're gifted in different ways. We grow in different ways. It is the diversity that I can look at someone else and say, gee, that's a nice way of putting it, and I hadn't thought of that before, that we can have cultures mixing together, that we can celebrate and have fun together. That becomes our strength as a community, that we take all of these individual talents, all of these individual gifts, and we're able to put them together for God's use in making life better in our church community and in the world around us. Now the questions that come to mind this morning are, are you in or are you out of the community? Does the community need revamping? If you were paying attention to my semi-sermon last week, you would know where I stand on that. Does the community need new definition or new boundaries? And that's an interesting concept to think about because normally we think of communities and churches having particular geographic boundaries, but that's no longer the case. Churches have the ability to make a digital presence that goes all the way around the world. We may put together a group on Facebook or one of the other platforms that's available to us that meets once a week to discuss scripture or whatever that may be stretched out all across the United States, maybe some of our armed service 
folks from around the world or maybe somebody even from a different culture and a different religious background that wants to be in touch with us. There are ways of finding community even though we are a diverse group of people. Are you in or are you out of the community? These are some of the things we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks as we explore different ways that the church of 2022 can come back to the foreground of leading in the way of making disciples for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God, we have not known how to use the gifts you have given us. At times we have misused and abused your gifts, not knowing how to use them in a world where homelessness, pain, disease, injustices, and death affect young and old. We have not encouraged the downtrodden or the outcast of our societies. We continue to build bigger homes, drive fancier cars, and wear fine clothes at the expense of those who live below the poverty line. Forgive us for our lack of caring and sharing. God, we have not known how to use the gifts you have given us. We have failed to share words of wisdom with our young, those words that let them know that they have value and worth, those words that help those in prison know that though they are locked out of our society, they are not locked out of God's grace or mercy. Forgive us for not using our gifts to bless. God, we don't want to be ignorant, so help us use the gifts you have given us in the spirit you gave them to build your kingdom and your people. Amen. Every once in a while, things happen to us that God shakes our faith a little bit and makes us rearrange some of our priority. And this happens to everybody. And in this particular case, I want to share an incident that happened with me this week. The other day I was making a trip to Kroger's. And one of the things that I went in to get was one of those little disc batteries that you put in your remote for your car, your key fob. Mine had been acting up and I was pretty sure it just needed a new battery. So took the fob apart in the car, went inside, got the battery, and came back out along with some groceries. And I knew I needed to put it back in or I wasn't gonna get my car started. So I'm sitting there and find out that this little disc is on a piece of cardboard and like double wrapped in heavy plastic. And I'm trying to tear it open and of course that doesn't work at all. So I remember that I do have a knife that a little pocket knife that I keep in my center console. So I got that out and I was trying to whittle around it so that I could pop the battery out without doing any damage to it or without cutting my finger while I was doing it. <clears throat> I was getting somewhat frustrated as I do from time to time when it comes to those physical uh, attributes that you need to do things. And all of a sudden I start hearing violin music rather loudly and I'm thinking to myself well who in the world's got their radio turned up that loud that it's coming in and why are they listening to classical music about that time I looked up and directly through my front windshield I saw a man across the road the entrance road into Riverwalk who had set up a very small PA system and was playing a violin He had a little sign there that said, I've been laid off, I lost my job, I have three children to feed. Help if you can, God bless. And he was playing. And I was thinking to myself, those thoughts that go through when we see the folks on the corner that are asking for money and everything else, is this real, is, is this a scam? Is he really playing the violin or is this just something that's recorded that he's, you know, pantomiming as it is? And I, as I watched, I thought, no, the move, movements are way too smooth. He really is playing. 
And I sat there debating whether or not I should get out of my car and go over and drop something in his collection box. And about that time, God threw these thoughts through my head. I'll spend a hundred dollars to buy a ticket to go watch somebody perform music who doesn't need my money. And yet I question putting a few bucks in someone who has just as much talent that is playing right in front of me and has a real need. I don't even know why those thoughts go through my head because God has always put the message there that if you have the ability to share, you share. So after listening a little bit more and really finding myself enjoying the music, I got out of my car. I walked across the traffic lane and I put money in the box. And as I went back to my car, I noticed that there were a lot of other people doing the same thing. They had gotten in their car and they were ready to leave and something caused them to stay. And they were now getting out of their cars and going over and dropping whatever they could in this man's collection box. My bills were paid. I had cash in my pocket. God has blessed me in many, many ways. So why should I be questioning when someone has a need? God lets us wrestle with our faith every once in a while. But God always wins. As you hunker down for the storm, check on your neighbors. Make sure they're safe that their house is warm, that they have food, they have the necessities to be inside for a while, or just talk to them and let them know that you care and you're available if needed. We live in communities for reasons. We worship in communities for reasons. Let us be active in both. Now may the grace of God, the loving example of Jesus Christ, and the very empowering movement of the Holy Spirit be with you in everything that you do this week and in the weeks to come. Stay safe, stay warm, and I hope to see you in person again next Sunday morning. Amen.